Welcome to another episode of Sadie Says. I am your host, Natalie Sadie, and joining me today is co-founder of Building Construction Group, Scott Harris. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to be here, it's glad. Well, I'm excited because you have worked on some incredible projects and I've seen photos, like my dream house. I have to take you to see the real thing, but. I'm gonna hold you to that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, to start with, you've worked um, with some pretty big names. You've worked with Kevin James, Ed Begley Jr. You've um, even worked on restaurants for Gordon Ramsay. Yes. Which one, even if I haven't mentioned them, has been your favorite so far? Uh, I would say my favorite has been Ed Begley. Because to, you know, to me, when you're building a home, what's amazing about it is, is getting to know your client. Mm -hmm. You know, a home in a sense is just a lot of materials and things that you're putting together with, and they're all woven in a sense, but to get to know your client and to find out, like, if I didn't learn something new from every client, then I didn't really listen to my client enough or do the job. But Ed, like, the things that he taught me were just, you know, fascinating. And so he what, changed my life. What sort of things was he teaching you? Because he has one of the greenest houses in North America. That's what I they believe. say. That's what right. they've said. Yeah. So the things you were learning was it in regards to that, or was it something completely different? You know, it's uh, it, he challenged me and challenged a lot of us to do something that we haven't done before because I was always the anti-green guy, and so when I met Ed, I kind of. What he did is he allowed me to kind of see and think about things a little bit differently mm -hmm. and to question what was done. And it was um, that moment where you kind of have to wonder, was I doing the right thing before or was I not? And so collectively, we did something that I think is pretty amazing. Well, every time I read about you, that's the house that comes up the most, I guess, because of everything that it stands for in a time where people are trying to be very aware of their carbon footprint but you said you were actually, at least initially, anti-green. Correct. So, are you against the movement or is there a part of it that you were against? You know, I, I don't even know what the movement is, but I don't know if anybody truly does. Um, to me, it's the whole idea of green, you know, before I met Ed and maybe even still now, just as some form of like, it feels like it's manipulation from political sides and media. And a lot of times people are using green just to put more green in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And it's, to me, there's, people have yet to actually understand and what the things are that they need to do that will actually make the biggest change. And you have these people that are so focused and focusing all of us mm -hmm. on the things that don't make a change. So in a sense, the idea of doing it is good. You know, I'm happy, I'm excited for it, but there's so much guilt associated with it and that you're always supposed to feel bad that, you know, like, I have to get yelled at by my wife because I took a bag in the store, you know, and I took, she's like, oh my God, you took a bag, you know. It didn't change anything. But I didn't how do change you know the world. It didn't change anything. You know how I know it didn't change Tell anything? Because I actually looked in the store and I could see like there's just thousands of square feet of paper and packaging material everywhere. And I'm supposed to feel guilty about this little tiny cellophane thing that I took home with me. But don't you think then, by taking a reusable bag or not taking a bag at all, that that is one less bag that's in our oceans. And we, at the moment, have this massive trash problem in the Pacific and I'm sure in the rest of the oceans. Totally disagree. Do you? I do. Why? Because that whole thought of that conversation is just takes us to the wrong process. So the answer is yes, of course mm -hmm. it makes a difference, but you know, the whole thing is that we're supposed to, where everyone's going to these straws, like mm -hmm. Starbucks. Oh, hey, we can't, we're going to have to suck on a, like a biodegradable straw. Or I go to this event, I got like a metal straw and I think I'm going to chip my tooth, like, because I have to feel bad about this. And my fork starts like breaking down in my plate because it's are degrading on me. But I can't. Where are you getting your disposable products from? Like, I have never these had. These events. I've never had a straw start to break down. <laughs> you have. I've never had. No, the, the biodegradable ones, and you have to kind of keep, and they keep going down. down I need so. to start going out with you, because I want to experience this. I, have, I genuinely haven't had it. Paper straws, admittedly, are not right. the best. I have found a couple of places that have better ones that don't feel awful in your mouth and don't sort of get that thing in the center which breaks down, but never with cutlery. Yeah, but like, here's an example. You know, we are all supposed to feel bad about using too much water. Mm -hmm. Number one, I, I go out and there's a lot of water out in the ocean. So it's like this cool thing where we actually don't run out of water. 
And it's this really cool thing, this ecosystem where you never lose the water on the earth so that we think it's like our last drop. And like my son has to tell me- between clean drinking water and seawater. Yeah, but it all comes, it goes up and then falls down and then it circulates through. I mean, it's, yes, we're not supposed to put dirty stuff into the water. That's one thing and that's true, but we're not running out of water. It's impossible to run out of water on the earth. Do you really believe that? Oh, yes. Have you gone out into the ocean? I have. One There's of my so much places. water out there. There is. <laughs> But do you understand the difficulty and the cost associated with turning um, that water into drink drinkable Absolutely. Water? One of my good friends that I've known um, for probably 30 years now is one of the people that was actually responsible for going around the world and selling these desalination devices that actually allow them at a very low cost to be able to desalinate the water. And But there's a lot of reasons that people don't want to do it because there's a lot of they say it's affecting the bio systems in the ocean. And so, you know, but here's like, back to the point about the water. Here's where my, my frustration comes in about the whole thing. You have, as a residential group, which is the people that really affect and that we're, we're told, we take up about eight to 10% of the water supply. Do you know where the rest of it goes to? I'm assuming industry. Industry, but how much most of it agriculture. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're driving on the five freeway and I just see like, little tiny almond trees and middle almond trees and bigger almond trees and I see signs like you know grow your almonds here and when you realize it's like 60 percent of the agricultural water is going in there to actually feed the almond trees and then you know where the almonds go? Tell they, me. They go to the Orient because they love them there they're really popular so you can become a business owner here you can buy land I can use up all my water I can use 60 percent 70 percent of the water and I could just ship them off for a food source yeah, we as 10% of the group or 8%, let's be, con you know, even be conservative, it's 10%. There's only, and we're asked to reduce our, our usage by 10, one, 10%. The math of that is how much am I affecting? Well, so. 1%. For anyone that follows me on social media, I always talk about the power of one. And I yes. get it, that one bag that I use may not that day make the biggest difference, but if even though if only 3% of us are reducing our waste and all of that, doesn't that start to add up? And doesn't it then have to shift through at some point? I mean, you would think so, but it's, it's not. I just, I don't believe it's gonna change. I mean, it's it, because I think that we're still being manipulated because when you realize that like 10%, we're supposed to reduce our, our usage by 10% and we're only 10% of the people, you've only affected it by 1%. Right. And there's only, as you said, there's 20% of that. So it's like, it's now a fraction of a percent. And so the message I'm just trying to get across, it's not my message, mm -hmm. but it's just things I lay in, you know, this is really weird. We have a lot of water. Why do people, I think about these things at like 3.30 in the morning and then I'm fascinated that it's 3.33 and why are we <laughs> using all this water? And, you know, I, it doesn't make sense. It saddens me. You know, it really makes me sad to see my son say we lost a drop of water, yet we don't understand that the problem is, as you said, making the water dirty. We're not losing water. Mm. It's putting the things, but then I get this thing from my water source telling me with, you know, there's a, there's like a woman with her clear glass of water and the sunbeam just hits it perfectly and she's drinking it, she's pregnant, you know, and, and you read through all the toxins that are in there. I mean, there's, it's like this much. Mm. And you realize that the, the radiation, the arsenic, all the things that are in our water supply, that's what's saddening. And those are things Absolutely. that make us sick, but we don't talk about those things. I think it's such a big and overwhelming conversation that people kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't, I don't want to talk right. about it. I mean, building a house, for example, when I've needed supplies to, to build something at my house, the first question I always ask is, where is that wood from? Which is something that most people don't do, but there's a lot of wood being cut down from forests that are thousands and thousands of years old. Things like that bother me, that people won't even have right. those conversations so that those forests can remain. Are they conversations that you have as a builder? Yeah, I mean, and also the saddest thing is when they put ugly floors in, I just gotta say. <laughs> like, there is nothing worse than they cut down a forest and it's ugly. Mm -hmm. But there's the, our natural resources are amazing in the sense that they should be reused, you can recycle them. Mm -hmm. I mean, to take something and reuse it is amazing, but there's so many people that are out there that, you know, here, here's another thing of mine. I have a lot of pet peeves, so. Go for it. <laughs> it's, you have people that say that they wanna do something green and I wanna have this amazing, you know, and I'm gonna take everything out and I want recycled stuff, but people don't understand that 
the greenest thing to do was not to do anything in mm -hmm. their home. It was just to live with what you have and polish those floors and clean them up and, you know, refluff that pillow. That's the thing that, that people forget, they don't understand, because this whole green thing of, you know, we're going to go out and buy something green. So I'm going to go get rid of all the lights in my ceiling and I'm going to go buy green lights. And I'm going to buy, since they're green, hey, I'm going to get 60 of them, right? I mean, why yeah. not? They're green. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I liked about Ed, love about Ed, and that he taught me is it wasn't so much about the whole green idea as much as it was about the idea of uh, conserving, mm -hmm. using less. I mean, that just is brilliant. It's genius, you know. We used less when we built his house. We did less. We spent less. And those are the things that, to me, make sense. It's... And that's the whole thing. We seem to live in a time where it's all about excess and I've got to have the best and the latest right. and all of that. And so then you go back to working with Ed, who's minimising it all. Was it fun or was it initially a tough um, sort of step to take to use less and just have less going on? I think it was a natural step. I mean, to me, luxury is something that's in the mind. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. It's a perception. It's a marketing term. It's a buzzword. It looks good. You know, people subscribe to it. There's people on Instagram, hashtag luxury, I'm cool, and everyone thinks they're luxurious. But to just go down to the fundamentals of, you know, I think about things a little differently sometimes. Like I, I'm, I'm the weird guy that's on the, off to the side just tripping out on like the animal's little ant hill there. Because I think how quickly it is, a, you know, life on this earth knows how to, to quickly fabricate their own homes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they don't have air conditioning they don't have lights. They don't have any of these things, but they live so comfortably. You know, and if you've ever stuck your hand in the ant hole or, or got into like those little dens, they knew how to do it. Mm. And they can assemble their homes in moments, you know, they can take it down and there's no destruction to the earth except the beavers, you know, I guess they make in their dams. And but the even gophers. that's it. The gophers, because yeah. They just, I love them though. Yeah. They're amazing, but they do. They destroy but they, everything that they, they make have. little holes for the snakes to go through. Yeah, right. Well, that was why I read because I was very upset about. I haven't seen it, but I've heard about men coming along our street with these big sticks, and I found out recently they're uh, they've got electricity. There's men running with big sticks them. running around. Yes, <laughs> killing the gophers on the nature strips because they're making oh, such I a see. mess. But then I was having an argument, or should I say, a discussion with somebody, and. They were saying, but look at the damage and destruction they cause. And I said, yeah, but have you ever read about all the help that they give to the natural sort of environment under our nature strips? And they're like, no, they're just a pain. Yeah, I, I mean. I haven't I, seen a beaver in action. I've only seen yeah. a lot of I mean, it sounds like some weird people you're hanging out with. <laughs> I didn't know there's men walking around with, like, with big sticks sticking like them said, in holes. Like I said, I haven't seen it, but apparently <laughs> that's what they do, and that's when the gopher holes stop appearing for a few months, and then they come back. But back to like you know minimalism, it's, it's um, less is more mm. to me. It doesn't have to be, and so you can conserve and have more. You can enjoy life and use less. You can consume and without exhuming all of these, these natural materials. And you don't have to have, I mean, these massive homes. Mm. Our clients like them, we build them, we're happy to build them for them. That's what our business is. Like, do you want one, call us, we'll do it. I'm not a hypocrite. <laughs> but there's a message though, and like to be told and to respond to you, yes, it should be less. So we talk about, well, you've just talked about these big homes that you build. How big roughly was Ed Begley's house? Let's see, I think it was about this, no. Um, his <laughs> home was, a, his home, uh, it's the, around th three to 5,000, depending on how you calculate, because yeah. there's all kinds of different creative mm -hmm. ways. But, you know, it's a modest home. It's got a few bedrooms. It's got a nice place to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a little office for Ed downstairs. It's got, like, the guts of the building down in the basement. So it's reasonable. A house should be the size of the, that fits the family. Of course. And that's really the size of the house should be. You know, if you need more space, you need it. But um, that doesn't need to be big. And since you've worked on that property, is it, um, is it, has it become a thing that clients come to you for, saying, I want a green house or I want a greener house? Some have. It, most haven't because, okay. it, you know, what's interesting is the one percenters are not always the people that are thinking about those things. Um, and I think some of our clients have and they're interested in it, but 
I think in some ways it hasn't come along enough where it actually makes sense to everybody. Okay. You know, it's people are logical. And so if you say, hey, would you like to buy this, this unit, this air conditioner unit, and it's an 18 seer mm -hmm. because it will save you money, but it's going to cost you six times more now, yeah. in about 12 years you'll make up your losses or you'll break even, they're not interested in it. And so that's where I think it doesn't always make as much sense. But you do need the Ed Begley's of the world to yeah. be the trendsetters um, of this thing. But, you know, my, one of my, my thoughts or concerns about this whole industry is that there's no education about it. There's, there's really, there isn't a path that I know of that where you can actually go and evolve. And my concern is that construction has never really evolved as the level that it has been. I mean, like, a, you know, homes today are like a 1978 Pontiac. You know, as far as the way we just put up a bunch of sticks, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of mud, you know, it's some paper-backed drywall. And the fact that you can become a lawyer, a doctor, you can do all these amazing things, but you can't become a builder. I mean, I don't know, have you ever heard of a college? Like, a, hey, mom, I'm going to USC, and I'm going to get my master's in building. Well, no, it's it's very much a blue-collar profession, and right. you go out and you learn That's while why. you're working. So did you see my new blue collar I wear? <laughs> I love your yeah, blue collar. This is to my blue collar yeah, profession. Fancy blue. But you can't do it, and it's to me, that's why the it's one of these things that got stuck. You know, I mean, you look at the evolution of an iPhone and an iPad, like what, just in a matter of years, how it's evolved. But if I take apart a home from the 20s, in some ways, it's still built better mm -hmm. than they are today. And well, they seem to be built a lot cheaper today, yeah. which I realize saves funds, but also the construction, they don't stand up as well and the materials degrade a lot faster. Yeah, like a lot of homes are built today to last as long as your mortgage. Mm. So it's been good for business because we're always <laughs> reaching these homes, but... You know, it's, we don't, as a society, we're so thought and caught up in ego. And we think about what is that person across the street going to think when I build my home? And what is she going to think when she walks through my door? And what is he going to think? And what is she going to tell? And that's our thought. Mm. It's not about what's inside the walls. I mean, we live in stage sets, right? I mean, it's just all an illusion. It's a fantasy of like, you take a shell and you decorate and paint it with whatever your illusion is and whoever you want to impress, but that never ever gets you to the right place because if you don't have the foundation of your home right, mm. it doesn't really do what a home should do. And to me, a home should really heal people. It should, it should bring peace to people, you know, like people, too many people's lives are in pieces. And I Absolutely. think when you build a good home, it brings you peace. And it's just that simple. Like, life doesn't have to be that complex. No, I, I agree with you. And I, for me, my home has always been my haven. It's, um, it's that space where I can go and get away from everything else in the world. But I notice that for a lot of people, it's, it's not that at all. It's just a place to lay your head. It's a place to be able to show off and say, this is me and this is wonderful. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel as if that movement kind of started in the 90s where the Merck Mansion started coming to right. be. Is that timing right or do I have it all wrong? Is that when I started paying attention? Well, I think there was these people, I think they're called the Egyptians, mm -hmm. and they were building mansions back then. Well, they were. Yes. But then I feel like <laughs> things got downsized and then they started going up again. But certainly in the suburbs in Australia, was the 90s were when the McMansions started to really become prevalent in the suburbs where there was less outdoor space and more house per block, whereas yes. previously it had been smaller houses, plenty of outdoor space for kids to play and, and run amok. Yeah, I mean, there's an evolution. I think there's a lot more money that's available now um, to people. So I think there's been a shift of the wealth. So mm -hmm. the people that are more wealthy are just have opportunity to build bigger. And I think that goes to the ego of wanting to, you know, always impress your neighbor. And mm -hmm. here's what's interesting and healing to me is I found some of our clients actually that we've built big homes for are saying, I want something smaller. Mm. Like, I want something that fits. Like, a home should be like an outfit, mm -hmm. right? I don't have to wear this big baggy, you know, thing yeah. that doesn't really fit me and I'm never comfortable. It should, it should house you. A house should just house you. It should clothe you. It should envelop you. And that's why So some of our people are actually doing it. We're kind of excited that there's a, maybe a little bit of an evolution shifting there to go get away from the McMansion. Well, that's so nice to hear. And... Before we finish up, because we are running out of time, I always like to ask everybody if they could share something with us that nobody would really have any idea about themselves, so. 
Um, something that nobody knows about me. Um, or at least the, the greater public wouldn't know about you or expect. Really? Mm. Can I tell it here? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm not <laughs> I can't tell that stuff. I was like, what am I, what am <laughs> I about like, to hear? No. Uh, I mean, probably one thing that people don't know about me is that I was smoking for many years. Oh. And I finally decided to give it up because I didn't want to be one of those people that were sick and um, one of those things you just hide because I wanted to be on this earth longer and I wanted to teach people things and I just wanted to be able to teach my children things so they could teach others. So, so I decided to throw it, roll it down the window and then I tossed it out. How long ago did you do that? That was yesterday. <laughs> so how's no, it I'm all kidding. going I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that was about seven months ago. Well, seven. congratulations. It's, so. a, it's a big thing. I've never yeah. been a smoker, but I've watched many people in my life struggle with giving it up. It's a big thing. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much. I could talk to you for another hour. Okay. But we have sadly run out of time. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Sadie Says. Thank you.